listening to the best of the Martha Zoller Show. To hear the full show each day, tune in to AM550 and FM102.9 WDUN or log in to accesswdun.com and click the Listen Live button from 9 to 11, Monday through Friday. Joining us right now is Governor Nathan Deal, and he's got a couple of things in his back pocket. He's got a new children's book that's come out called Veto. I love that. I can't wait to talk about it. And he's also involved in something called the Democracy Defense Project. So we've got a lot to talk to with the former governor. Nathan, welcome to the program. Well, thank you, Martha. It's always good to hear from you and to talk to you, and thank you for what you do for the education of the children of our state on the state school board. That's a that's a great honor that you have, and I know that you are providing a, a valuable service to the people of this state. Oh, thank you so much, Governor. And i got to tell you, when uh, Governor Kemp first asked me to do that, uh, they, they needed to get somebody filled in quickly because the person who was before me, Kevin, had, had gotten out, you know, had already resigned and, and, or had gotten to the end of his term. And so they go, I said, well, how long is it going to be? And they said, well, it'll be about a year. And I was like, okay, great. I'll do that. So I go to get <laughs> sworn in and it's a seven year term. <laughs> <laughs> and yes and, you're locked in <laughs> that's right and so i know now though why it was a seven-year term though because it really i'll be honest with you it took me about three years to get my feet on the ground and really understand well we had covid the first year and then to really understand what we were supposed to do who to go to what our role is and i'm in my fourth year now and i really feel like i've hit my stride Oh, good, good. Well, that's the reason those terms are long like that, because uh, governor's appointments uh, overlap. And and I still have some members of the school board that that I appointed while I was governor. So uh, and it's a great group. And I just uh, I'm I'm appreciative of your serving it in that capacity. Well, I appreciate you and and the great education role that you've served. And so before we get to the Democracy Defense Project, I want to talk about this book, Veto, because first of all, (laughs) I love the title. I love the title. And tell us how you came about to decide to write a children's book and then to call it Veto. (laughs) <laughs> well, it, it's a long story, and I'll try to abbreviate as much as possible. Uh, several years into my governorship, uh, we decided that we needed some cats to be able to guard the garden and keep the chipmunks from eating everything up. And Chris Riley, as you know, was my chief of staff, and Chris has a farm out on Clark's Bridge Road uh, in Hall County, and his mama cat had a litter of kittens. So he brought two of the male kittens down to the governor's mansion, and uh, they lived there. And the staff, I think, named them Bill and Vito. <laughs> and this is the story that is told through the eyes of Vito the cat. Now, the origin of it all was that my wife, Sandra, who, as you know, had been very prolific in her reading books to children to try to inspire them to want to learn to read themselves, uh, she had asked me, After we left office, she was still getting requests to come and read to children in schools and libraries, et cetera. And she'd read to over a thousand individual classrooms while she was first lady. But she asked me, she said, would you write me a children's book? Because I have read all of the good ones that I have, and I want you to write me one. Well, you know, if you don't have a deadline, you'll say yes, and which is what I did. And then a year or so later, when uh, we got the diagnosis that, uh, Sandra had brain cancer, I realized I hadn't done anything on writing her that children's book. So I got busy and I wrote it in its original uh, form. And as I told the publishers of the book, when I took it to them, I said, this is a true story. It is just events that are told through the eyes of Vito the cat. And um, so that was fine in its original form, but they, when they uh, read it, there was a point where they were moving the cats from the governor's mansion when my term was over up to our house here in Habersham County. And the cats squealed and screamed all the way up here in the back of the Suburban, opened the Suburban up, opened the crate they were in, and they went running out my driveway and ran into the woods. And that's the way I had written the original version. 
And I said, no, tried to call them. They get them out. They wouldn't come out, but they did come out the next morning. And the uh, publishers said, well, what did they do in the woods that night? And I said, I have no idea. I told you this is what I saw and can verify as factual. It's just told through Vito's eyes. And they said, well, we think your readers would like to know what they did in the woods that first night. So (laughs) I said, you want me to move from fact into my imagination? They said, yes. So I must admit that was the part I had the most fun writing. And what it involves, it involves other animal characters that Bill and Vito meet. And I believe that one of the better ways to teach children things is maybe having an animal say things, such as Oliver, the wise old owl, who says uh, your courage is a candle in the dark. Uh, maybe having um, maybe having another animal like Helen the heron uh, define what patience is so that they learn that. It is, uh, it is intended to be a book where it not only teaches children how to read, but it encourages them to uh, learn some lessons along the way. Well, that is so much fun, and I'm so jealous because, you know, <laughs> I've written I've written nonfiction my whole career, and I have such, I have such, I don't know, desire to create characters and to create things like that, but I don't know if I can do it. <laughs> well, let me tell you about the one that I in, enjoyed the most. Now, we live in the country up here on the banks of the Chattahoochee River, so we see a lot of different animals. And um, one of the animals that I thought could be used effectively was a possum. And uh, if you think about a possum, they're not the most uh, delightful-looking animal Mm -hmm. in the woods. Uh, They're quite the opposite, honestly. But we know in our generation what it means to say you play possum. Uh, that you're pretending you're dead and hope things will leave you alone. Well, this is uh, this character is um, he's an unusual possum. He comes in saying, "To be or not to be, that is the question." Oh, hello, fellas! Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Percival, but you may call me Percy. And Bill, Leto's brother says, what are you? And he says, an actor, of course, <laughs> but, but also a possum, more correctly, an old possum, but nobody uses the proper King's English anymore. So, you know, this is a, a character that's introduced, and I think it just shows that you may not be the most handsome individual in the world, but if you've got a personality, people will pay attention to you. So... Now um, I think I, I know. I think I know where Katie got her acting skills. Now <laughs> <laughs> it is I mean, Governor Deal. It is so good to hear you laugh. I'm telling you what <laughs> it is. It is just wonderful to hear you laugh. Now, if people want that book, I mean, literally, I just went on and pre-ordered copies for all my grandchildren. I'm going to bring them up for you to sign. Okay. <laughs> well, good. Um, good. But if people want to get the book, how can they do it? Well, it is available on Amazon, but let me tell you about an event that's coming up, and uh, it relates to what the school board of Hall County and uh, Superintendent Will Schofield did in naming the new elementary school after my wife. And it's going to be dedicated on August the 26th at about 4.30, 5 o'clock. And then following that dedication, and I would encourage people who are interested in seeing this new school to, to make sure they come on that event. Um, and what you will also see is the unveiling of a portrait of my wife, Sandra, uh, that was painted uh, by uh, our local artist, uh, uh, Travis Massey. And he's done a great job with it, and it will be unveiled that day along with the formal dedication of the school. But immediately after that, we're going to go to the Ramsey Center over at the Technical College, as you know, just across the four lane. And uh, I'm going to be presenting the book at that time, and I'll be signing books, and we'll have a little of a reception there. So I would encourage people to come. We'll start there about 6 o'clock on uh, August the 26th. Absolutely. So we'll remind everybody about that particular event and hope everybody can come uh 
You know, it's funny. We lost uh, uh, Lynn's mother three months ago, and mm. we just had Travis take a portrait of her and redo it. And he's just amazing, isn't he? He is a great artist. And I did not realize that he was uh, an artist in, in terms of painting until I went to the dedication of the portrait of David Ralston down at the state capitol. And he painted that, and it was excellent, and it hangs there in our state capitol. So I requested uh, Travis if he would do one for of Sandra, and he has done it. And uh, I am more than pleased with it, and I hope everybody else will see it and that they will uh, agree with me. He did a great job. You were involved now in a bipartisan group of Georgia leaders called the Democracy Defense Project. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I understand that the uh, one of the originators of this idea was my friend, uh, Chris Christie. Uh, I knew Chris back when uh, I was in Congress and heading up the uh, Health Subcommittee, and he was the chairman of the Republican Governors Association. And he came and testified before my committee when we were working on uh, reforms to Medicaid. So I've known Chris for a long time. He was kind enough during my campaign for governor to come down, come down and, and help campaign with me. So when a group like that that he uh, is a part of asked me to be a part of this effort, uh, I certainly accepted. It is a bipartisan group here in Georgia. It is uh, me and Saxby Chambliss as Republicans and Roy Barnes and Shirley Franklin as Democrats. So the purpose of the group is to try to give some confidence to the voting processes in our country. And as you know, they have been under attack from all sides. And it's important, I think, and I think the group thinks, it is important to restore confidence in our election processes. It is one of the hearts of democracy, and we can't let it fade away. So, and what concerns me, and we, you and I have talked about this for years, is just kind of the level of the rhetoric. And just yesterday, uh, President Biden sat down with CBS News, and he was asked the question about whether there would be a peaceful transfer of power. And he said he wasn't sure. He wasn't sure hmm. if there would be a peaceful transfer of power if Trump got elected or if Trump didn't get elected. And I just think as the President of the United States... What you need to be doing is going out there and talking about the greatness of this nation, about how we've had 40, you know, 47 peaceful, 46 peaceful transfers of government, regardless of what you think about January 6th. Everything happened on time. It was wrong. It shouldn't have happened. When you disobey police, that's wrong. And you shouldn't do all of that. But things, our Constitution worked. Things happened on time. And the president of the United States should should champion that. Absolutely. He should be the one that is saying, see, it works, and we've got to make sure that it continues to work. Uh, Our founding fathers were very wise men, and uh, I think the longer we engage with issues that we have never contemplated before, the more we realize uh, the strength of that wisdom that they had when they put this document, our Constitution, together. Now, I know you're working with Governor Roy Barnes um, on this uh project and we you guys were together in gainesville not too long ago um in celebrating abbott massey and um uh it's i don't know if it's me or i think he's been sort of unleashed since he's not in politics anymore and he's just a good old (laughs) lawyer because he is much more relaxed he he's a lot more fun to talk to (laughs) i don't know he seems better (laughs) he does Roy, Roy is a nice person, even though we ran against each other for governor. Um, we were friends before that. We were in the state Senate together. He was there when I first arrived uh, after the 1980 election, and uh, we remained friends during all of that time, and uh, we're friends now. And he, he is a great lawyer, and he's having a good time, I think, just practicing law again. So what do we need to do to restore confidence in our election system? Well, I think, first of all, is that uh, we need to try to eliminate and beat down any, uh, any allegations that are false. Uh, one of the worst things that we can have happening is false rumors, 
things that deter people from voting. Um, those are the kind of things that allow apathy to set in. And apathy means you just don't show up and vote at all. And that's not the way that you make a democracy work for the betterment of the people of our country. So the project is designed to sort of be a watchdog, if you want to say it in those terms, of, of looking at what is happening, perhaps if there are things we see that need to be changed, of making bipartisan recommendations as to what those changes ought to be, and then coming together to refute any false accusations. You know, I have a little saying that I I um, say just about every day on the show where I say the three things we need to do to make this country better is we need to vote, we need to parent our children and the children that are in our lives, and we need to sit down and have a face-to-face conversation with someone. And I think that's what's missing, Nathan, is that too many people are keyboard warriors and never really interact with people that disagree with them. And instead of just sitting down and having a cup of coffee and maybe learning something from someone. That's right. None of us, uh, we're all guilty of just forming our own opinions, whether they're true opinions based on facts or not, and then refusing to listen to someone who has an opposite opinion from us. Um, You know, the legislative process, and that's what gets criticized a lot, the legislative process is one whereby you reach compromises. And I think that's one of the big problems we're seeing at the national level now is that nobody is willing to compromise on anything. You don't always get everything you want. But if you get some of what you want and you improve the process in doing so, then you should accept the compromise. But now we're saying each side say, well, it's all or nothing. It's everything the way I want it or it's nothing at all. And that's what we've gotten. In many instances, we've gotten nothing at all. Well, Governor Nathan Deal, um, I appreciate you. you. You're a good long-term friend. We've known each other a very long time. If you want to know more about the Democracy Defense Project, it is all spelled out, democracydefenseproject.org backslash GA if you want to see exactly what they're doing in Georgia. Uh, but I, I look forward to seeing you at the book signing on August the 26th for the book Veto. It will start out at the Sandra Deal uh, School that is at 430, and then they'll go across to the Ramsey Center at about 6 for a book signing. We look forward to all of that, and thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, my friend, Martha. I appreciate the opportunity. It's where North Georgia comes to talk. It's the Martha Zoller Show on AM 550 and FM 102.9 WDUN. Joining me right now is John Ashbrook from the Ruthless Podcast. Their new episode for Thursday has dropped today. Uh, It's called Worst VP Pick with a big question mark. And John, you know what I mean? I I have been on panels with Van Jones before. I have debated Van Jones before. But recently... I've been like saying, okay, he's nailing it, and he is being intellectually honest, even though I don't agree with him policy-wise. Yeah, well, Martha, he certainly makes a whole lot of sense on this particular topic. By the way, great to be back with you Thank this morning you. on WDUN. I understand it's nice and sunny down in Georgia. It is raining here in Washington, <laughs> D.C., just a miserable city. It's gorgeous. And uh, <laughs> I, I, I always love coming on with you. Well, I got to tell you, so this pick was surprising to me because they've won, uh, you know, uh, is it, I don't know, Wisconsin? Is that what it is? Wisconsin, Minnesota, Minnesota uh, for uh, 50 years. And Josh Shapiro, what I'm hearing is two things. They didn't like him because he was Jewish. But secondly, they thought he, he wanted to be an active vice president. And Tim Walls said, I'll do anything you want me to do. That's what I've heard. I think that's probably right. Um, I also I also think that the left just gets too cute. You know, they they think that just because Tim Walls looks a certain way and they can say that he was a uh, in the military and they can say that he was a football coach, uh, that all of a sudden that means r- regular old people who are Republicans are going to think, oh, well, you're right. I'm actually going to vote for the socialist for president. It just doesn't work that way. But the left 
uh, professional left just sort of delude themselves into thinking that that's that's how it um, that's how it is. Honestly, Martha, this is this is the best development that Republicans have had in weeks. You know, last week we were really on defense. Um, you know, J.D. Vance was answering a ton of questions, and then Trump was taking shots at the best governor in America, and every Republican was sort of playing defense, and now it just completely flipped, and it's completely flipped because of the Tim Walls choice, and it was dumb for them not to take Shapiro. You know, Van Jones is exactly right. Republicans were terrified that Shapiro was going to be her pick, and there were actually groups who were polling Pennsylvania to make the decision whether it would be smart for Republicans to just pull out of that state altogether. The so, problem with Tim Walsh... Oh, go ahead. No, you, you go ahead. The problem with Tim Walsh. The problem with Tim Walsh is, is not only was it a bad decision to take Walls over Shapiro, but he just keeps getting worse. I mean, you've seen all of the all of the veterans who are completely losing their minds because of these these uh this stolen valor scandal but i just learned this morning they met me I, I, you remember at the at the kamala rally where they introduced him they made him sound like he was kirby smart you know like he was like a head coach and he brought this state the school to the state championship he was a defensive coordinator and i don't get i mean defense wins championships everybody loves a good defensive coordinator but why not just say he was the defensive coordinator why not just say yeah he was in the military instead they have to act like he was charging into battle when when it turns out that's not true and you know democrats really this is i'll i'll, I'll shut up here in one second but as much as we on the right complain about how easy media is for Democrats and how fawning the coverage is for Democrats, sometimes it comes back to bite them. And, you know, there's an old law in physics that for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. And I think the same thing applies to politics. And in this case, the easy press who wasn't asking Tim Walls questions when he was running for governor and, and completely dismissive of any criticism of, him inflating his resume, inflating his service, that has come back to bite them because he wasn't properly vetted, and I it, it and it maybe got them got Democrats a governor's mansion in Minnesota, but it, it could cost them a White House. I also think since you and I are the type of people that are counting down until college football starts, that. These are the kind of people, the people that are around Kamala Harris that are writing the speeches and giving the advice, and even her and Doug Imhoff, they don't look like football fans, okay? Uh, and I don't mean that in no. any pe pejorative way, but they probably didn't know the difference between a defensive coordinator and a head coach, okay? So, they probably, probably didn't. You know, they got they a bunch of people didn't. around them that go, oh, football, yeah, we'll put that in there. And, of course, he's a head coach. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Those dweebs in the middle America will go for the football line. That's what they said. That's what they thought. <laughs> they're just so, they're just so stupid out there. We'll trick them again. That's right. That's right. So you mentioned the greatest governor in the country, and of course you meant Brian Kemp when you said that. And of course Monday and Tuesday, you're right that this decision kind of took the wind out of that sail because Monday and Tuesday. On my show, on Todd Starn shows, on lots of other shows that had lots of Georgia listeners, uh, it was pretty tough couple of days because you had this range of emotions between very strong MAGA Trump supporters, but also they voted for Brian Kemp because just look at the numbers. They did. And they're like, why did he do that? And they're holding their head in the hands. And then you got people that don't like Brian Kemp. There's a few of those out there. But I would say my calls were about 70, 30. Why did Trump do this? He's ruined. He's lost right. Georgia. Um, Todd Starnes, uh, who comes on after me, that's a national show and is a lot farther to the right than what I am. Um, same kind of thing. I talked to Todd and he goes, yeah, I had the same problem with my listeners. So it seems like Kemp did the right thing again. He hasn't risen to the occasion. He did one statement saying, you know, leave my family out of this. And that's all. He's moved on to worrying, doing what governors do, which deal with disasters. We have, you know, Hurricane Debbie going on, and so he's being governor right now, and he moved on. And it seems like Trump may have, too. But, but the bottom line is, all Trump's got to do 
is stay positive, look forward, talk about issues for 90 days, 88 days now, whatever it is. And then if he wants to yell at Republicans the day after the election, fine. I don't care. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I think, look, everybody is everybody on our side, at least, wants to defeat Kamala. They don't want America to become a socialist country. And they're keeping the main thing the main thing. And I just think to the extent that Republicans can keep can keep doing that. That that gives us a shot at winning. I mean, we, we need every every vote we can get. We need every person pulling in the same direction because she can win this race. I mean, you saw how the polls tightened. It's it's back to a toss up. And this morning, Charlie Cook, who you I'm sure you've talked to on the show before, uh, rates all of the rates all of these states. He switched his ratings back from lean R lean Republican in Georgia to a toss up in Georgia, and I. You know, I, you would have a better sense of whether that's accurate than I do. But we both know that if Republicans are not all coming together to to turn out the vote, we could lose to a, a, a lunatic socialist. Yeah, and I mean, that, but that could really be neighborliness, bad. John. It could be neighborliness. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just neighborliness. <laughs> I know. Coming to your house and killing your family is, you know, is neighborliness, yeah. you know? Yeah. So I stole that from Smug. <laughs> Smug said that earlier today. Yeah. I was listening on the way in. But look, I think what we got to do is pretty simple. I mean, we do have to be united. I think there is a little, there's a little bump for her right now. There's some excitement. She's new. She's young. You know, she's staying on teleprompter, all of that. She's, she's drawn big crowds, all of that. There's a little bump there. There's going to be a bump, I think, between now and the convention. And, and they'll have a mm-hmm. beautiful convention and what what I think is I love what J.D.'s doing right now where he's following her around <laughs> and what he did yesterday where he went in front of Air Force Two to the press gaggle and said, hey, since she won't talk Very to you, funny. I will. It's great. Um, yeah. I love that. Uh, and just keep them on, off their game and then come out of the Democratic Convention with a consistent thing. But she's been running ads during the Olympics. She's everywhere watching Olympic coverage. I haven't seen, I've seen a couple of Trump ads, but not like she has. Um, She's spending money and we're going to have to spend money too. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's exactly right. And there've been some articles written that, you know, not, it's not just in, in Georgia where there's a disparity between spending uh, uh, among Democrats and Republicans. Hopefully some of these uh, groups get rolling here and, um, and start spending. We need the advertising. The message has to get out because, you know, not only does she get the advertising she pays for, she gets the advertising in the news every night that um, that's free of charge for her. Well, so I mean, and honestly, she, John, you've written speeches before. She's not saying anything in her speeches. She's talking about no. lowering inflation, lowering costs, but she's not acknowledging she's the one that is part of the administration that raised it. And She's right. just giving these speeches and no one is calling her on it. And so I want the debates to happen because at least, and I think they will, um, at least somebody will challenge, at least Trump will challenge her, even if the, even if the yeah. moderators won't, right? So we've got yep. to get the message out because there's plenty of stuff in her own words from the last three and a half years that all you got to do is run that stuff on a loop and we should be able to win. Yeah. Yep, you're you're exactly right. And now she's she's doubled the lunacy with Tim Walls. I mean, you probably played the clip where he said that if they build a thirty foot wall at the yes. southern border, he's going to invest in a thirty foot ladder company. I mean, it's it's absolute absolute insanity from the left on there. And we've never had a ticket like this. You know, we've we've never, I don't think, in the history of our country had a, had a ticket this well, this far left. And I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I think I read somewhere that his first job was in China and then he come to teach in China and then he comes back here and I'm like, okay, (laughs) I don't believe the whole Manchurian candidate thing, but I'm saying that probably had an impact on him. (laughs) Well, uh, Josh Shapiro didn't spend years in China teaching. He's just, it's just like, I didn't, I, I, for the life of me, I'll never figure out why, why they took, um, 
Walls over Shapiro, but, you know, their loss is our gain. But what is funny about Shapiro, and I, I guess we'll never actually challenge him until he runs for higher office, which I think he will, um, is that he comes off as this sort of people perceive him as being a more moderate Democrat, but he's really not. Okay, I mean, you listen to right. what he says, it's pretty right. radical. And even the two weeks leading up to him right. being considered, he got more and more radical as the two weeks went on. I mean, I know he that's was right. trying out, but still. Yeah, no, that's 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 exactly right. He, I mean, th- there's there's really there aren't very many on their side anymore um, who are middle of the road type uh, politicians, which is a real shame because you know we used to have a pretty even system in this country where everybody uh, dis- might have disagreed about politics but tried to find some common ground in the middle and. The Democrats have just gone so far off the left. So um, one, you know, one. and yes, just just yesterday before her her uh, rally, Kamala met with an anti-Israel group, a self-described anti-Israel. She met with them. It just it makes no sense. It's like why why are you, why is she doing that? Why isn't she meeting with voters? Well, in that vein, um, two of the squad have been beaten in primaries, um, and. Right. Ilan Omar has her primary, I think, next week or the week after. And the guy that's running against her ran against her last time and um, got within 2%. So it's it does seem like the country is starting to see who these people are and they're voting. Because I believe in, in voters overall. I believe in voters. They'll eventually do the right thing. It may seem in one individual election that it that it's crazy. But if you look at it over time people do the right thing and if you're not representing the area you were elected for people are going to vote you out so do you think we might lose Uh ilan omar i mean it's a great question um it would it would sure be nice to send a (laughs) message um but but i i don't know i uh i actually haven't seen seen the polling on that race so it's hard for me to say with any degree of certainty but I, there, there does seem to be a backlash of, of sort of normie voters who really don't like this hard left um, attitude that's coming from the Democrats, and and they're and they're at least trying. Some are trying to course correct. Hopefully, we can do the exact same thing on a national level with Kamala Harris. This uh, absolutely, and we've had ten years of politics in the last six weeks. So anybody who says they know yeah. what's going to happen between now and, and November. I mean, it's. I'm ready for the ride. How about you? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. John Ashbrook, the Ruthless Podcast. They're out. They're dropping Tuesdays and Thursdays. Uh, lots of extra stuff might happen between now and Election Day, and there's a lot going on with the Ruthless Podcast. If you haven't listened, you should. John Ashbrook, thank you so much for being with me today. Thanks, Martha. Take care. Putting the talk in news talk. It's the Martha Zoller Show on AM 550 and FM 102.9 WDUN. Bringing Bill Crane in here for Bill Crane's Corner because, you know, nothing was more, you know, on display than how important Georgia is uh, in the last, you know, week. I mean, we had a Kamala Harris rally. We had a uh, Donald Trump rally. We were supposed to have a big event with the new VP in Savannah, but due to weather, they're not going to do it. But they were going to come back to Georgia this week. Uh, So Georgia is in the thick of it, and we need to be united as a state and as a party. Good morning, Martha. I have to agree with you. I I don't understand watching the Trump rally in Atlanta Saturday, why he can't speak more to the record that he had on any number of issues, but particularly on the economy, while serving as president and what a second Trump term would look like versus the grievances, greatest hits, talking about the 2020 election, and not just taking shots at other elected officials, like you referenced, the governor, the attorney general, the secretary of state, but also the first family and the first lady, and trying to indicate there's some sort of untoward or inappropriate relationship between Governor Kemp and Fonnie Willis. It just, uh, bizarre is not a strong enough word, but it's the kind of thing that causes me to have to say, I'm not sure that there is a path for Vice President Kamala Harris to beat Donald Trump, but there is a path for Donald Trump to beat Donald Trump. Yeah, and I think that what's got to happen, and, and you know, the, the RNC books pitches me guests all the time, and they were just 
um, pitching hard to have somebody before the rally and then after the rally. And so we had somebody on Friday to talk about what was upcoming. And we were on Monday. I did a, a education show. So we didn't do it Monday. On Tuesday, we had someone scheduled and they kept changing the person that was going to be on. And finally, they called me that morning and said, hey, they're not going to be able to be on. And that's when I took the opportunity uh, to the communications folks to say, look, I know this is probably not going to go anywhere farther up the line. But let me just tell you something about 70 percent of the calls I got from both people that supported Trump and not. Uh, said that that was a big mistake and it's it's going to impact the way they feel about him. And then Todd Starnes, who's on after me, who is much more Trumpy than I am. His audience <laughs> is much more Trumpy than I am. And he had about the same numbers. He and I talked about it afterwards, that that it was overwhelmingly from his listenership, people saying it was a bad idea. So I what I said to this person is I said, look, I don't know if you can pass this up the line or not. And I've called every contact I have. But talk about the issues, talk about the future, and this is your election to win. That's all. He also called out the names of three state election board members who are Republican appointees who've been involved in some rather significant rule changes on how local boards of elections certify the results, results electorally, uh, excuse me, uh, post-election. And those results, of course, get sent from local counties up to the state and then to once certified at the state level, that's in a presidential contest. That's how we determine who receives in Georgia as a winner-take-all state the electoral college vote. So it's pretty clear that there's a partisan involvement. Our state party chair has been having emails and texts back and forth with those board members, and now the president calls them out by names as being pit bulls fighting for free and fair elections. And the reason I bring this up is, I don't think he did that effort or those three individuals any favors. Well, and help the people understand, because we've talked about this on the Georgia gang for several weeks, but help people understand um, what is going on at the State Board of, of Elections, and what they do, number one, and number two, what is happening right now. There have been some not insignificant changes for the State Election Board in terms of its structure in the last several years. For many decades, the Secretary of State served as chair, there was an appointed vice chair. The Republican Party and the Democratic Party of Georgia each had two appointments. That would that would give you a five-person board, the vice chair typically presiding, and the Secretary of State not even always attending meetings. After the 2020 elections, the General Assembly removed the Secretary of State from the board. Which and was wrong. Chair. That was wrong. I, I agree. Um, and in effect, neutered somewhat the agency, but left it administratively attached to the Secretary of State's Office for Staffing and Budget Purposes. Then the following year, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation was given the, the legal authority to begin election investigations, reporting to the State Election Board, and somewhat neutering, again, the Secretary of State's longstanding Elections Investigation Division. And then, well, most recently, they changed the way the board is appointed. So instead of giving each party a number of designees, the party... Uh, the, the Secretary of State is no longer on the board. The vice chair or the chair is appointed by the governor. And then the board members are coming from appointment by the lieutenant governor, the speaker of the House, and each party, each state party gets one appointment. So you got a Republican party appointment, a Democratic party appointment, one, one, and then three appointments that are gubernatorial, state House and state Senate. And when all three of those happen to be Republican, they're going to probably appoint Republicans. So you have a current makeup of the SED of four to one, and three of the newer members have been championing a number of extensions or expansions of the role of a local board of elections member. So where I where I see this going, and the same thing's been happening at Fulton County's board of elections, is members of the board who previously had a more or less administerial role, and they oversaw the double counting to make sure that numbers were the number of people that showed up to vote matched the number of ballots. The number of precinct numbers were the same. They were basically count, recounting ballots is the role of, of those people in the certification process. They now have passed a rule change at the state level that will go into effect in 20 days prior to the next general election that will allow a state or a local election board member to say, I don't, I don't like this. Something's wrong. I want to see the, the list of everyone who voted at this precinct, or I want to see the complete list of mail-in ballots. 
to slow the certification process or perhaps postpone it indefinitely if you were to do that in Fulton County. That's 7 to 10 percent of the entire state's votes. And then if the counties don't certify, then the state can't certify. And if the state can't certify, then our votes to the Electoral College don't get tabulated when they're tabu- they're counted on January, the, the first uh, Tuesday in January. So it allows, and then this is going on in multiple battleground states, it allows a creating a legal path, if you will, to blocking certification before it ever gets to the U.S. House chambers. Well, you know, I hate the politicization. I mean, I know you can't keep politics out of these things because secretary of states are elected by party, all that kind of stuff. But I I think it's interesting because I think Brad Raffensperger is an interesting study in how to survive. Okay, and he went from being the guy that nobody wanted to have lunch with to winning a very large majority in 2022 in his reelection. And that's some and then but. Then it seems like, and look, Brian Kemp went through this with the legislature trying to take power away from him when he was Secretary of State. They, they just they, cut head count instead. They yes, absolutely. So, so this is not new. This is not new. Po- politicians wanting to play in election processes, but I just think now it's so blatantly partisan that we need to move back from it. Well, I, I think what is new is if you. As an example, in November, let's say I still believe Donald Trump carries Georgia, but let's say it's closer. Let's say in a fictional world, uh, Vice President Harris carries Georgia, and they don't like the results, or they believe there was some ballot harvesting activity or whatever in Fulton and DeKalb counties. A single member of the Board of Election, not a majority, can with this new rule change hold up the certification of those ballots. And what I think this ultimately does is causes people to lose faith in the process. The process should be clean fair and balanced, transparent. But if we make it too partisan, as you just referenced, over time, people start to look at our the way we hold elections as not being all that different from the way they do it in banana republics or on the, in the Congo, um, where it's whoever's in power is going to try to control the outcome before the fact. Well, Bill Crane, thank you so much for always shedding light on these difficult subjects, and we'll get together next week. Look forward to it. To hear the full versions of last week's Martha Zoller shows, go to the podcast page at accesswdun.com, and you can follow me on social media at Martha Zoller.